Welcome everybody to stream biomonitoring and BIBI. This is a class of the Snow King Watershed Council. So let's talk about stream biomonitoring first of all. So stream biomonitoring is a process where we use the insects and other creatures that live in the stream that are called benthic macroinvertebrates uh, to evaluate the health of the stream. So benthic means living in the bottom of a body of water, in our case, the bottom of a stream. And macroinvertebrates are creatures that don't have backbones, but they're big enough that you can see them. And there's a variety of things that fall into that category. And as I mentioned, they're good indicators of stream health, and we'll talk about why that is. So be it, stream biomonitoring is one assessment method. There are other assessment methods, including what's called BIBI. And BIBI is a quantitative method that's used by agencies to evaluate, evaluate the health of benthic macroinvertebrates. It stands for uh, benthic index of biotic integrity. So in this method, you collect the organisms, you preserve them and send them to a lab, and then they generate a score based on uh, how many you found of what type and how many pollution tolerant versus not pollution tolerant. And we're going to go into that in more detail a little bit later on. So in general, the reason why we use macroinvertebrates is for a number of reasons. One is because they're relatively easy to collect. They're abundant in a small area. You'll find hundreds or thousands of them. They typically remain in one place for a long time in one particular little section of a stream. They may often be there for more than a year and they vary in their sensitivity to pollution. So if you find ones that are less pollution tolerant, that gives you an idea that you have a lower level of pollution where if you find only the pollution tolerant ones, then that might tell you you have more pollution. There's a number of different ways that they're classified. And so this is just looking at overall, how do you classify uh, animals in general, but then specifically macroinvertebrates. And they even get down to a much more detailed level than the order level that we're looking at here. So for instance, within mayflies or stoneflies or caddisflies, there's a lot of different varieties of those type of creatures. Uh, within that category. And generally speaking, uh, for most of these, we'll just go to the category of the level where we identify it as a main mayfly or as a stonefly. But in some cases, we get more specific, like within the caddisflies, we may identify specific different types of caddisflies because some of them are more or less pollution tolerant. In terms of looking at the anatomy of uh, benthic macroinvertebrates, they have certain structures. And so if you get familiar with what you're looking at and then compare it to a diagram, you might look at one and you go, okay, well, this one has gills. Well, this one doesn't have gills or this one has three tails. This one only has two tails. Um, this one has particular type of legs. Uh, this one has got, uh, <clears throat> different different structures so basically just having a sense of what you're looking at and what the name of the term is can help you when you're looking at a guide and comparing it to one of the creatures that you've collected these creatures generally go through um, kind of a transition a metamorphosis and so some of them go through what's called incomplete metamorphosis some go through complete and essentially one of them goes from goes through four stages between egg and adult, and the other one goes through three stages. Typically the version that we're finding is the larval um, stage is what we're finding in the stream. They can also be classified by feeding group. And we don't necessarily, um, we don't have to categorize them into these different uh, functional feeding groups, but it kind of gives you more of a sense of where you're going to tend to find 
those type of creatures. So for instance, if you're more in a headwater stream or you're more down towards the mouth, you may tend to find more of one or another of these. But essentially, um, they primarily feed on uh, leaf and twig plant debris. Uh, and then some of them that are predators feed on one another. We also look at different places in the stream where they live. <clears throat> so some of them may live more on the surface. Some may be embedded in the bottom. Some may be clinging to a rock or to a plant. And so we call these different areas uh, microhabitats. And we also look at sections of the stream where we're more likely to find things. So if you look at a stream, a pool, it's pretty obvious what a pool is. It's where the water's really not moving much. A riffle is where it's moving rapidly, maybe over some rocks. And a run is typically where you have like a longer, straighter stretch. And typically we're looking more in the riffles because that's where you find the, the highest abundance of the macroinvertebrates. We talked before a little bit about pollution tolerance. So essentially that's, that's what we use to in, indicate or come up, help us come up with our index of water quality is based on the pollution tolerance. And so the method that we're using with Global Water Watch's stream biomonitoring is a three level classification. So they talk about um, <clears throat> group one as being uh, least pollution tolerant, group two is kind of intermediate and group three is, three is most pollution tolerant. There's different classification schemes that uh, are used some use a four level classification, but the one we're using with Global Water Watch is a three level classification. So these are some of the common ones that we find in group one. <clears throat> so if you find a lot of stone flies and a lot of mayflies, these particular types of caddis flies and water pennies, um, then that's giving you an idea that you've got better water quality. And as you look at some of these, you might think, well, how the heck am I ever going to identify what these are? And I'll say that after a while, it gets a little bit easier once you've seen them a bunch of times, but also we use really good um, guides with a lot of pictures that help us identify exactly what we're looking at. And it helps to have someone with some experience that's out there that can say, okay, that's a, like for instance, where it says amphipod, refer to that as a scud. Um, You'll be able, we'll be able to help you identify those because basically how they look, but also in some cases how they move. Like the, the black fly that you see up there um, tends to stick itself to something and wave around, kind of like one of those things that's on the side of the road that they blow up with air that waves back and forth. So there's certain behaviors that can help you identify the creature as well. And then group three is considered the most pollution tolerant. So certain types of snails, leeches, uh, midges and worms, if that's all you're finding, then that indicates that maybe the water quality is not that great. So in terms of equipment that you need, just pretty basic equipment to help you collect, sort, and identify the different things that you're, you're finding in the stream. And then obviously appropriate clothing and something to record your information on. So we'll kind of go through each of these. So we use two different types of nets. So one is called a D net, and it's just called that because the opening is shaped like the letter D. And that's something that you can use to sample different edge habitats or other habitats maybe that are outside of a riffle or if you have a very small riffle, um, it's helpful for sampling that. And then the other net is called a kick net or a seine, and that's got a couple poles and you stretch it in between them, you weight it down in the bottom of the stream, and you disturb the stream upstream of that um, and collect what comes into the, the net. And so for larger streams and riffles, that's a useful net. We also use various uh, tubs. And what we'll typically do is we'll collect a sample, we'll put it into a tub, we'll collect another sample, put it into another tub, and then um, that's the easiest way to 
identify or help or see what's moving around is once you've put it into one of these tubs. <clears throat> Magnifying glasses are helpful as well because some of these are really tiny and they're actually hard to see. And then we've got different guides, um, both diagrams, drawings, as well as photographs that'll help you identify them. Typically we use a sorting sheet. And so as we identify things in our tub with our sample that we've collected, we'll pick it out of there with uh, typically just like a pipette or a spoon, or in some cases some forceps, and then put it into these different, um, we'll put Petri dishes full of water on, on a, a sheet on a table with these different categories. And so we'll accumulate uh, ideally a hundred different organisms to let us know we've got a representative sample and we'll sort them into these different categories, which then ultimately will transfer to our data sheet. So how do we go about it? So the first thing that we do is we find a location that we think is a good place to sample. So generally we're looking for a riffle. And when we sample in the riffle, we wanna approach from downstream so that we're not kicking organisms loose from upstream that are then entering into the area that we're sampling. So we're just sampling that riffle. We're not changing the characteristic of that riffle. We'll either use a SANE or a DNET or both. And uh, again, with the, the SANE, we'll have one or two people will hold the poles, uh, keep the net angled at about a 45, place it on the bottom of the stream, weight it down, and then start turning over rocks, rubbing off what's on them, and kind of uh, turning over the bottom immediately in front of the net. And <clears throat> ultimately that'll generate, uh, that then we'll collect a bunch of the creatures that float into the net. So you can also try sampling um, undercut banks or woody debris. Uh, you can collect some dead leaves. Those are places where you may find some of particular creatures, uh, rocks, basically a variety of different habitats that are present at the stream. So once we've collected our sample in a net, then we use stream water, we rinse them into a sorting tub. and then we'll sort them out. And so in some cases, there may be some things that remain on the net. So we do what's called picking the net, but we also are gonna look into the tubs, identify what's moving around, collect it, and then categorize it. This is a photograph of the sorting sheet that we use that helps us put them into different categories. And sometimes what we'll do is We'll do this, but then in the middle, maybe if there's something we can't identify, <clears throat> we'll just collect it there until somebody brings a guide over or somebody more experienced can help you identify it. But essentially the sorting sheet helps with the process of sorting out all the things that we find. While we're there, we also do a habitat assessment. And um, you'll see when we do BIBI, we also do a habitat assessment as well. So typically, when you're doing this kind of biomonitoring, you do it in conjunction with the habitat assessment. On our biomonitoring form from Global Water Watch, they have a particular habitat assessment form. And so this is a place where you can record your observations and maybe make notes on how things are changing from year to year. So maybe it's more shaded than it used to be, less shaded, the riparian zone is more intact or less intact. That might help you explain why you're finding a better result or not as good of a result as what you found before. And we are going to, in a subsequent class, we're going to talk about a more detailed habitat assessment process and sheet. So then you start recording your results on the biomonitoring form. And if you look at the form, you can see it's divided into group one, group two, group three. And so we'll just start recording. Okay, did we find anything uh, in group one uh, types of caddis fly? Did we find mayflies? We're essentially, we're not necessarily, we do want to count the amount that we found in each, but mainly we're determining, did we find something in that category or not? And so that's going to be our number of taxa. <clears throat> and you can see that if you look at the form, uh, 
there's going to be some weighting depending on if you found more group one, group two, or group three. And we'll go for, through this form in some more detail. So we're going to count up the number of individuals that were in each taxa. So for instance, how many mayfly did we find? We're going to make a note about whether it was rare, common, or abundant. And then we're going to enter that code in the spot for that taxa. So let's say we found 10 stoneflies. We would put letter A, abundant, in there. And then leave it blank if we didn't find anything. <clears throat> then, depending on how many we found, so let's say in group one, if we found one of everything, uh, or maybe we even added some additional ones that based on our guide are extremely pollution intolerant. We would take the number that we came up with. So if, it, if we found one of each, our number would be six. And we're gonna multiply that by the weighting factor. So in the case of group one, that would be three. So our index value, if we found one of each of those things, uh, our index value would be 18. And so you could see if we found all of group one, we found a couple of group two and maybe some of group three. Then if you look at the bottom where it says stream quality assessment, um, that's where you could get a, a higher value and indicate that you've got better water quality. So that is the process for the stream biomonitoring. So pretty straightforward. Um, it's actually pretty fun as well when you get out and do it in the field. Now let's talk about BIBI. So BIBI is a more quantitative method and it's used primarily by uh, scientific agencies, but also by some nonprofits to evaluate and compare the health of benthic macroinvertebrate communities across streams. And the overall score is based on a number of different metrics, um, including taxa richness. So that's essentially, if you compare that to our stream biomonitoring index, that is, so how many different taxa did we find? And then percent of species would be, okay, how many did we find that were pollution tolerant? What percentage of them were pollution tolerant? What percent were uh, pollution intolerant, and then based on that, they're going to get a score of 0 to 100. This is an example of the map, which is found on the Puget Sound uh, Stream Benthos website. And there's a couple different views that are given to you there. Um, this is kind of a really a helpful view because it gives you kind of color-coded what's happening geographically. And if you look at the, uh, the key to this map on the bottom, you can see that essentially what we find is that in the urban areas, we tend to have worse quality water or worse, worse uh, the population of benthic macroinvertebrates is, indicates worse water quality, which is kind of what you'd expect that in the areas that are more undisturbed, you'd have better water quality. I would, well, you might be going into this. I would interject that that's, uh, it's associated with higher impervious services. So places where there's a lot of cement, you know, basically the water hits the cement, it shoots up really fast. It takes all of the gravels and things like that with it in the stream. And uh, it's just not as good a habitat for all the different bugs. And then all this, as well as pollutants and all the nasty things that washes off the road, like, you know, motor oil and brake dust and, uh, you know, fertilizers and all that kind of stuff. And so um, the interesting thing to me about BIBI and looking at this map is that like, it's not just that point, it's the whole watershed. So it's everything upstream of that point. So maybe you have logging or something like that going uphill and you've got a lot of fresh development or something like that with um, like fine sediments coming down and they fill up all the interstitial spores between the uh, pores between the rocks and it makes it so that it covers up the bugs and it's not good habitat for them. They don't have any good thing, algae to eat and things like that. Um, yeah, and 
I don't know, I can keep going. <laughs> but I think it's really cool because when you when you zoom in on this map, um, there are some surprisingly good scores close into um, you know newly restor restored sites and things like that. So it's not all bad news, you know, yeah. like Seattle area. <laughs> but yeah, that's true. Um, there's actually uh, I was working recently with uh, the city of Bothell, and there's a creek called Palm Creek in Bothell that actually has a surprisingly high BIBI score, even though it's in an urban area. So there are those kind of outliers where you can look at it and go, what's going right with that stream, even though it's yeah. in an urban area. So some key points about BIBI is, uh, one is that the best time for doing this sampling is typically during August and September. Um, you can go through late, late July up to early October but you're going to find the most population uh, during this time. So when we do this on Sunday, uh, we may it'll be interesting to see what we find, but we may not find the same thing as what we would find if we did this in August. So really to have the most useful comparison, you'd want to do this at the same, same approximately the same time period every year and generally during that time period. The other thing is that you need obviously to be able to safely get to it and wait in it. And you need to have a riffle that's less than one foot, um, primarily because you're using a net. And we'll talk about this particular net that you use, but the, the net is essentially a foot tall as it rests on the bottom. And so uh, you wouldn't be able to collect everything you're disturbing if the water was deeper than one foot. We'll also talk about the pattern that you sample in, but you are looking to ideally sample four riffles in a, a reach of stream. Um, and another key thing to keep in mind is that uh, all your gear that you've used for sampling and that you've weighted in the stream needs to be cleaned and decontaminated. And we'll talk more about that specifically as well. So, by the way, I thank you, Leora, for you're my permanent model for uh, BIBI. I love it. Um, but this is Leora doing some BIBI sampling. And so you can see the type of net that she's holding is what's referred to as a Cerber sampler. And so that's a very specific net that's kind of funnel shaped. And it you can't quite see it there, but it has a metal frame that folds open. So it defines about a one foot by one foot area opening, but also there's a part that flips down onto the, the base of the stream itself that defines this one foot by one foot area that is what you're gonna collect your sample from. And then it's got a sample collection jar at the end where everything that you collect washes down into. So as I mentioned, it defines, the, the net frame defines this area and so within that area, you're going to first take any kind of large rocks and scrub them off by hand. And then you're going to disturb the sample area as defined by that front bar of the net for a minute to a depth of 10 centimeters. This is Leora and some volunteers with Whale Scout when we were doing this on Bear Creek last summer. Okay, and then I there's... Oh, sorry. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to mention the reason you go down 10 centimeters, um, it, as you mentioned with the, the other biomonitoring, is like, so you've got your grazers that are on the top that are eating the algae and things like that. And then you've got leaf debris and there are the things that eat the leaf debris and the scrapers and shredders and they go down there and eat the leaf debris. And then you have the predators and the predators like to eat them and they move much faster um, and they burrow down in the rocks. As soon as you start disturbing it, they burrow down. So about 10 centimeters, that's why you want to go that deep is you want to try to get some of those predators too, which are often intolerant species um, and longer lived species such as like dragonflies, which I found out can live for like six years in some streams, which is that's old for a bug. So, yeah, anyway, sorry. <laughs> there you go. So that's the reason why. So then in terms of the pattern, so there's two different techniques. Um, we use the eight square foot method, but there's an alternate method of collection, which is uses a three square foot method. But essentially what you're doing is you start downstream and you work your way upstream 
and you're collecting a couple different samples from each riffle. And um, so you, you move along up and you keep filling up your collection jar unless it becomes over full. So then as each sample is collected, uh, you rinse off the sides of the net basically to get whatever it might be stuck to the upper portions of the net down into the collection jar. And then ultimately you'll empty your collection jar into one of these tubs it, and uh, you're gonna use some uh, water that you've run through a, a sieve to filter it out so you don't um, accidentally add any bugs to your sample with the, the uh, garden sprayer, but you're basically using something to rinse out that uh, collection cup that you've removed from the net. And then we use a sieve to rinse off and remove any of the larger rocks that we have in there because ultimately all this stuff's going to end up in a jar. And so if we have a bunch of large rocks in the jar, it's just not going to fit. So we try to remove those large rocks, but we not lose any of our sample. So as we rinse it off, we're going to keep what is in that sieve and that will end up in our sample jar. And then ultimately the samples are labeled and they're placed into sample bottles with alcohol. They go to a taxonomic lab. And at the lab, they'll look at, the, look at it in detail under a microscope and really come up with exactly how many you had of each different type of creature and classify them to, um, we use what's called a fine classification. There's different levels of classification that you can use, but essentially they come up with a very detailed classification and a score. This is a graphic that I got from Mark from the Lake Forest Park Stream Keepers that talks about kind of the BIBI process as a whole sample. So they use the net to collect it. They clean off the large rocks. They disturb the one square foot area. They uh, remove specimens from the rocks and put them in our collection tub. They remove any kind of small rocks and woody debris after taking any kind of bugs off of them. Um, use the sieve for kind of final um, culling, and then you put everything into a sample jar. So in this case, they're using that uh, spatula to put their sample into the sample jar. And then ultimately, once the lab has processed the results, they get entered into a thing, at least in our area, they get entered into a website called Puget Sound Stream Benthos. And so uh, again, there's a couple different views that you can look at, and this is actually a neat site where you can really drill down and see uh, if you want, if you're interested in a particular stream or projects that are being done by a particular organization, or you want to look at a particular geographic area. So here again, you can kind of see our our urban areas aren't looking that great. Um, you can also look at it in a table view which is another way to compare. So again, same kind of color coding as to what the scores mean. Um, but this way, if you wanted to see the names of the sites laid out. And another interesting thing that you can see on this one is if you look across the top, you kind of have to turn sideways to read it, but it, essentially you can see the different criteria that are being looked at in determining the score. So while you're still out in the field, the next thing you need to do is, is be concerned about contamination and decontamination. And so one invasive species that has starting to spread throughout this area is called a New Zealand mud snail. And they're really tiny. So there's some different ideas of the scale of these things. So they might look just like a little piece of gravel, but they can be mixed in with gravel and they can stick to your boots. And then if you wear those boots, between sites, you could spread this. So there's some guides out there that can help you identify them. Um, but the best thing is to try to just avoid the contamination. So um, here's a map showing the watersheds that they're present in right now. And so you can see around the Puget Sound area, there's several different watersheds, including some of the watersheds that we're active in that, that these are present in. Hasn't made it to Raya 7 yet, which is good. 
uh, Kelsey Creek and Thornton Creek are particularly uh, full of them, I would say. And I, I would also mention that uh, this is not just for New Zealand mud snails. I would do this in any creek. Anytime you ever get into any creek, if you're going to be going to another creek within, say, a week or so, um, clean your gear. Try to clean it on site. You can get it. It's really easy to get a scrub brush, water bottle, rinse your stuff. You know, yeah, do, do what you can while you're there so that you're not bringing it to another site or your home because if it gets in the storm water, it could also spread from there. The thing that's scary about New Zealand mud snails is it only takes one. They're parthenogenic. You only need one snail. They're born pregnant and they can start spreading. And the problem with them, like, you know, oh, that's cool. It's a very successful species, right? The problem with them is that fish eat them and then it gets stuck in their gut, especially our little juvenile baby salmonids are having a tough time anyway in our area. Um, they eat them, it gets stuck in their gut and it fills up their bellies and they think they're full, but they actually pass through the fish alive. <laughs> so the fish takes them to other places and it's also starving the fish because the fish spent that energy to consume that snail and it didn't actually get any energy from the snail. And so it's like, it's really bad for fish. And um, yeah, we're trying to try to keep them contained as long as we can. Some places like in Montana and some of the other places where New Zealand mud snails have come, they have disappeared. Uh, we don't know why, <laughs> but they've gone away. Um, but if we can try to keep their spread, especially in the King County and in, in some places in the Snohomish County and in Olympia, um, if we can keep them in where they are, that would be great. But also there are things like chytrid fungus, which affects uh, frogs. It like rots their skins off. And uh, didymo, which is an al algal kind of bloom, kind of uh, diatomic kind of nasty net. They call it rock snot because it's like you're picking up rock snot. It's really nasty stuff. And we've got it up in the cascades all over the place. So in general, when you get into stream, try to keep the stream in the stream and not take it to another stream. <laughs> yeah, good advice. Well, thanks, Leora. So here's basically some of the steps that you can do to prevent uh, spreading it. So, you know, number one would be if you had the luxury of extra gear, you could use, you know, different gear that's dedicated to a particular site or watershed. But barring that, um, you want to try to clean your gear off as well as possible before you leave that site in that area. And so maybe, you know, either at the stream site or at your vehicle, you have um, some water spray and a brush. So um, these are some pictures I took when I was going out with someone who worked for the city of Bothell. And that person brings out a garden sprayer with some water and a brush. And so the basic initial is spray off the bottom of the boots. And then because she has to move from site to site on a given day, um, there are chemical methods of decontamination. And one of them is soaking it in 409 for 10 minutes. And so she brings a tub that she can set boots in and soak them. And then when she gets back to the office, would then, you know, put the, put that down the, down the drain. But uh, the easiest is probably just to clean it thoroughly uh, with the brush and the water and then let it dry for at least 48 hours before you would go to another site. All right, I have to update that. It's 72 now. They found oh. out New Zealand mud snails in particular can last 72 hours because they got a perculum and they close it up and they're just like sitting in there waiting for you to go back into another stream. I know you guys all like streams, so <laughs> try not to mess them up. Yeah. Great, all right, thanks for that update. Okay, and that's pretty much it. That's it for our presentation. So I'm going to stop the recording now and we'll come back to the group and just see if anybody has any questions about our upcoming field training.